Okay. Open floor. Q and A. Yeah. When I was young, uh, ten years old, I saw the Challenger explode. Ever since then, I've had terrible phobia of flying and walking Xanax levels. Is this a lack of amuna? I mean, we do say Birkat Gomel after international trips. So how do I approach this? Okay, the person saw something which was a very uh, frightening, devastating event. And ever since then, has had a phobia, saying, of flying. And does this mean that the person is suffering from a lack of amuna? Lack of, now we have to be careful with amuna, belief, trust in God. It's a complicated question and it has a lot of strands I can't do full justice to tonight. But one principle of the Muslim movement is that there's a gap between the brain and the heart. There's a gap between what you know on the one hand and what you feel, what your emotions are on the other hand. And the idea of fixing your life by getting your ideas straight for the Muslim movement is very naive. Getting your ideas straight won't do it. Of course, you better get your ideas straight, otherwise you'll be totally misled. But independently, you have to work on your heart to follow your ideas. That's an independent effort. So the fact that a person's heart is out of touch with reality and his behavior is out of touch with reality does not mean that his mind is out of touch with reality. His mind can be perfectly well in touch with reality, and his emotions and behavior don't follow suit. So if you ask whether having emotions that cause you to do things which you feel you'd be better off not doing, does that mean that you're, you lack emuna? If emuna means a belief in the mind that something is true, it does not mean that. Your belief can be perfectly, accept, perfectly correct, without question, and yet your feelings and your actions not be, be consistent with that. People who don't fly in airplanes but, but drive by car know very well that it's more dangerous to go by car. Not, many of them are not misled. They have no doubts. They think, nothing, but there's a hex on me. If I go on a plane, it'll go down. No, they know that it's wrong. They just do it anyway. So um, I don't think you should read into emotions and behavior that's out of control, that it must be that your mind and belief system is out of control. No, that, that doesn't follow. Um, so, it's, as I say, it's an independent effort to work on the heart to be able to follow what the mind says. Here, I think that modern psychology would uh, applaud with, uh, with all ten hands. Many people suffer from th from doing things which they know are wrong and are self-injurious and, uh, and do them anyway. And they regret them and they wish it wouldn't so and so on and so on. But it's not, not fooling themselves into thinking they'll get away with it. They know they're not going to get away with it. And they do it anyway. So no, I, I don't think that that's, uh, that, that follows. Yeah, in the back. To what extent can we create evil in God? Can we create what? Evil in God. Like we, because God, we're in, let's say, in God per se, and we have the right to choose good or bad, uh, and by doing bad we create, let's say, negative spirits. Could that affect God? No, and I think that the idea that we are in God is very uh, naive, and it's a very uh, misleading way to talk. Um, in is a spatial concept. A could be in B if A occupies some of the volume that's encompassed in B. Uh, God isn't a physical thing, so nothing can be physically inside God. So at best, we're talking poetry, and it's quite important to spell out what the poetry means. You know, God is here, God is everywhere, God is there, God is everywhere. Well, no, he isn't. God isn't located in any space. Only physical objects are located in space, and the last time I checked, God is not a physical object. So um, and let me just expatiate on this just a little bit. You know, we're all used to the fact that in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, there are statements which, if you take them literally and simplistically, are false. 
God is described as uh, in human terms in straightforward physical terms. And we say, oh, okay, but that's not meant literally. That, that, that means something else, and you can figure out what it is. Okay, okay, fine, everybody understands that. What about the language of the rabbis? Did they follow that style? Or in the case of the rabbis, by the rabbis I mean the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Midrash, the Zohar, all of it. Did, did they follow that style? Or in the case of the rabbis, whatever they say, if a six-year-old takes a dictionary and de decodes it, the six-year-old's got right what they meant, is that, is that, is that the way we look at the writings of Chazal? The answer is no. They followed the style of the Tanakh. Sometimes they wrote in poetry, sometimes they wrote in riddles, sometimes they wrote only in hints. And sometimes they used physical terminology for things that aren't physical. So um, the idea of creating evil in God because I'm in God and I do things that are evil, so then he's, this, this evil's inside of him, all, that kind of talk is, doesn't have any decoding into something true. Well, Yagur Chara, God, evil does not, does not uh, dwell where God is. So uh, it, it, it's, simply, it's simply not the case. The God's relationship to the world, at least one way of saying it, but Ramchal says it, is through his will. Everything exists because he causes it to exist. So when we say, there's no place empty of him, and you think of God as a kind of ooze filling up everything, you know, the, the air spaces, the bricks, the wood, you know, that it means rather that something that would be divorced from God, cut off from God, not relating to God wouldn't exist because he gives everything that exists its existence. He does that by an act of will. So that's so then will it come out that God's will supports evil? Yes, that will come out. But that's no surprise. God himself created evil. That's uh, the, the verse that we say in the beginning after Baruch Hu, Yotzer Or Ovar Echashech Ose Shalom Ovarei so you say, as I call. That's because the authors of the Siddur changed the verse from Isaiah. And Isaiah says, oh, say, rah, he makes evil. Um, one element in human being is the Yetzahara, so called evil inclination, which Chazal described with the words, Afili Yotro, Kro'ora. Even its creator called it evil. So does God do evil? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. That's not, a, that's not a contradiction. We can explain that if you want to hear that explained. But the point is, his will supports the existence of evil. That's for sure. A person like this, now I can take what you said, a person whose choices are bad is given life and free will and power and control by God. So his will supports evil. Yes, it does. That's true. It certainly does. But that's not the same as making him evil. That, 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 that wouldn't follow, and it's certainly not true. Well, motivated his desire is redundant, but it is, it is the motivation. Yeah, the motivation for the creation is loving kindness. Olam chesed yibana, the verse says, the world is built out of loving kindness. Yeah. Why loving kindness and not anything else? Okay. Um, you're asking why. So let me just give you a little sermon on how you ask why questions or how you don't ask why questions. Um, here's a scenario that uh, works itself out usually with 11-year-olds. You know, why is A? I said, because of B. And the kid says, well, why is B? Because, said, oh, of, B. because of C. <laughs> right now, he's clever. Why is C? You know, he's got you running. You know, he's A D. Why is D? Oh, this is a good game. You know, I'll push him to the wall. You know, we've only got until next week. So, let's <laughs> so now, the rule is this: if you're asking why and you're seeking an answer, you'd better not be committed in principle to always re-ask the question why. You'd better not be permitted to do that. Because if you're committed to do that, then you're committed to not getting an answer. You know, and then I would say, go have a cup of tea and leave me alone. Um, if you're going to go on and uh, keep asking why, there are only two possible outcomes. One is that you go on forever and you never get to the final answer. Or you go around in a circle, why is A because of B? Why is B because of C? Why is C because of A? Why A? I told you already, because of B. So, you know, we're finished. But that does seem to be unsatisfactory that everything's leaning on something else in the same circle, right? 
There has to be the readiness to stop somewhere and stop asking. Okay. Now, not anywhere, but it means this. When you ask why, you have to have a reason why you're asking. It's not a free question. There has to be something un, un, unfinished, some, something that's um, left undone, something that's, that's missing that prompts you to ask. So I'll give you an example. Uh, why do you drive a truck? Because I want to earn money. Why do you want to earn money? Because I want to buy a house. Why do you want to buy a house? Because I want to live in it. Not for investment purposes or design purposes, but to live in it. Good. Why do you want to live in it? Because I will enjoy living in a house. Why do you want to do what you'll enjoy? That's a stupid question. <laughs> Why do I want to do what I will enjoy? Because I enjoy it. See, that's the end of the road. <laughs> now, it doesn't have to be the end of the road, but it's acceptable as the end of the road. When he says, I'm doing it because I'll enjoy it, there's nothing left undone, which, because when you say you're driving a truck, some people drive trucks, and some people are accountants, and some people are soldiers, people do lots and lots of things. So how did you choose? Right? You want to make money? Well, some people don't want to make money. They, they, they want to just live a certain way in the forest or something else. Or, and then people want to make money for lots of different purposes. So I'm asking you what purpose yours is. There are lots of alternatives, and I'm asking how you picked your alternative. But some things are naturally the end of the chain. They don't have to be. Again, a person could say, I'm doing it for pleasure because pleasure lowers my blood pressure and I want to live longer. That could be. It could be. It doesn't have to be. So the, the why question, why are you doing something that you enjoy, isn't forced. It's permissible to say, this is the end of the line. This is what he's after. Right. So now, um, when you consider, so you're asking, why is it loving kindness out of which God operates? So the context will be, well, we're picturing God as an agent, and agents act for a variety of different purposes. How is it that this purpose is the one that he's chosen? Okay, so uh, the short answer to that is this. Um, there are only two alternatives. Either you do what you do in order to cause an effect on yourself, or you do what you do in order to cause an effect on others. And if you are already perfect, there's nothing you can do to improve yourself. So the motivation has to be to have an effect on others. And if you are perfect, then that effect has to be perfectly good. You as a perfect agent wouldn't do anything that's less than perfectly good, and that's why it's loving kindness. It follows from what God is that this is what he acts for. Ramchal well, says that roughly in, das, in the Das Tunes. Yeah. yeah. So unlike the times of the base of English, why are miracles or the presence of God less visible or obvious to us? They're not obvious to us, you say. But they're less obvious, I would imagine. Well, less obvious. obvious, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Well, then why in ancient times were miracles much more, much more obvious? Okay, so the, here's a fairly deep thing. Um, the key element in our existence is free will. Free will is a choice between alternatives. Different conditions of life deliver different alternatives. Alternatives are not the same, or usually not the same, really the same for two people, certainly not two periods of history. By, by controlling the conditions of life, God controls the kinds of choices that can be made. The choices that are made are how a certain type of spirituality is built, and that's the goal. The goal is to build various types of spirituality. So, for example, if you lived in the... In the uh, the desert with the people in 40 years after leaving Egypt before going to the land of Israel, there was no option for atheism. You were surrounded by open miracles. Is there a God? Isn't there a God? Don't be a dope. Open your eyes. You know there's a God. <laughs> other things, you can have a rebellion like Korach's rebellion and other things, but this isn't going to be a choice. In our period, it is a choice. So the circumstances create different types of choices, and they are the choices that God wanted for different types of, different times in history and different people in different circumstances, in different places in, in, in a particular time. Now, that's the general idea, but there's also a particular idea here. I think we overestimate the impact of miracles. 
if we transport them to, uh, to ancient times. For ancient people, they were surrounded by miracles. The sun's shining is a miracle. Lightning bolts are produced by the gods directly. Uh, the Nile overflowing every year is the action of a god that's, that's uh, supporting Egypt and, and making Egypt fruitful. Battles are won because the gods are fighting on your side. You say, you know, listen, I'm a Jew, and my God does miracles. The answer you'll get is, welcome to the club. You know, like, <laughs> all the gods, our gods do miracles also. You know, why does that make you special? Today, if a pillar of fire marched down Fifth Avenue, you know, from, from, uh, from the northern end to the southern end of, of Manhattan, from 9 p.m. till midnight, it would be all over, right? Right? The, the atheists would be done, and would be <laughs> it would be done because we live in a very different intellectual context. We have this conceit that everything is nature, and we understand nature, both of which are false. Um, and this would be a, a, an astonishing contradiction to everything that we think we know and we rely on. But it wouldn't be true in the ancient world. You know, when when uh, the, the plagues in Egypt, so. Our tradition tells us that each plague lasted a, a week, and then there were three weeks off till the next one. The Egyptian would say, so your God gets tired. You know, he needs to rest between plagues. <laughs> oh, we understand that. Gods do get tired. So it, just, it happens that way. So, you know, we, we, you know welcome to the club. So, so it has an effect on the choosing situation, but it isn't the effect that visible miracles would have today. Physical miracles today would, would make a, a gigantic transformation in our picture of the world and our, and our, uh, and our choosing. So um, the, the, the general answer then is God st structures the types of miracles that take place at any particular time to create the, choices, the conditions of choice which he wants to be applicable at that time. Well, people were more because of the miracles, you know, the miracles, people were more religious back in the day as opposed to now, right? So why wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't we have open miracles now in order to strengthen faith? Well, why wouldn't we have open miracles now to strengthen faith? Uh, because God didn't create the world as a game of solitaire. <laughs> We're supposed to participate, and you know, and if he if he does something which overwhelms us and produces a result in us, then it's not ours, and it hasn't. We have not created any new spirituality, and we become like squirrels. You know, he he overwhelms squirrels with his causation. And they do everything that he, that he causes them to do. So at each period in history, there's a certain niche that we are trying to conquer on our own. And that niche is chosen for the, the needs of this period in history as related to all the previous periods of history and what's contributing to the next period in history. And that's that's what, how, he, how he structures it in general terms. Why, why should he, why doesn't he exert more power and more control to produce the kind of behavior that he wants, because then it's a game of solitaire. We're not playing any role. Yeah. So why do we say Kadosh three times? Okay, Kadosh three times. Uh, first of all, we say this because the angels say it, and that's not trivial. We always, we always mention before we say it that the angels said it, and we're saying it. And the and the the reason they. A reason, an explanation of what is this. This goes quite, uh, also quite, goes quite deep. Um, let's back up. The angels say it. Why do the angels say it? The angels are created in such a way that they say it. You know, does God need to hear a recording? You know, like, <laughs> you know you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. Like, what, does that do, what, what does that do for him? Nothing. But what does it do? What does it do for anybody, for anything? My oldest son explained this to me uh, in the following way. Imagine that you have a recording which says the words, the temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. That's what it says. And it'll repeat 24 hours a day, you know, uh, two, uh, 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 three times a minute. The temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. Sometimes it'll be right, sometimes it'll be wrong. Right? But that's what it says. Now you have a thermometer, a talking thermometer. And it tells you the, the temperature. And when it's 20 degrees centigrade, it says the temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. Is there any difference between the two of them? They're saying the same words. Well, the difference is that when the thermometer says it, it's true because the thermometer senses the temperature. Where the recording is just mechanical, straightforwardly mechanical, 
without any relationship to the real temperature. So if you think of the angels like the recording, that it is really in, uh, inconceivable that that should be, have any function. Well, he creates them and programs them to, to say, holy, 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 and they say, holy, 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 because he programmed it, and then the, the recording plays on and on and on. No, he created them as holiness readers, holiness indicators, <coughs> holiness responders. They, they have a way to sense holiness. And when their sensors are aimed at God, they register the objective existence of holiness there. Well, that makes a gigantic difference because when they say holy, 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 then I know it's true because that's what they register. So when I take their words, it's not just a recording. It's that, that they who register these features of the world are saying it, and therefore it's a correct description of the world. Now, the word kadosh means a lot, but one of the basic meanings of kadosh is separate from. Separated from. Also connotes separated from one thing and connected to something else. That, that's, but, but it definitely has a sense of, of, of being separated from. So there are three dimensions to be separate from. One way to put it is heaven, earth, and time to be transcending the whole of the dimensions of the physical world. There are other ways to put it. But that's the idea. The idea is kadosh means separated from, superior to, selected out of, and then you have the different dimensions. When you look in Uval Etzion, where you say it in, in Hebrew and then you say it in Aramaic, it has their three dimensions which the kadosh applies to. Okay, so I, <laughs> but you didn't uh, respond to what I said last time, which was, as opposed to what? <laughs> and we, you seem not to grasp the logic of that, so I'm not going to go back to that, that, that's back and forth uh, again. But let's just go through the scenario, right? They all heard God speak directly at Sinai. All the people heard God speak directly. Each one heard it himself. Not that Moses went up to a mountain, came down and said, guess what happened to me on the mountain? Oh, have I got a story for you, like other religions. No, we all heard it ourselves. And in fact, Maimonides says, puts a little more detail in, he says, we all heard God speaking to Moses. He wasn't speaking to us. We just overheard him speaking to Moses. And this is pretty closely, closely uh, described in the verse in chapter 13, uh, 19 of, uh, of Deuteronomy, of, of Exodus, where it says, I'm going to speak to you, God says to Moses, I'm going to speak to you so that the people will hear me speaking to you and they will believe in you forever. So, the first point is, we ourselves witnessed God speaking to Moses. So we know that God spoke to Moses. That's not up for question anymore. That's step one. Step two, we asked Moses to be the intermediary. We said, we don't want to hear God anymore. This is in both in Deuteronomy and in Exodus and in Deuteronomy several times. We don't want to hear God speak anymore. You'll be the intermediary. God will speak to you, and you'll tell us what God said. Um, commentaries indicate that Moses was upset with that idea. Wouldn't it have been better to hear directly from God than from me? But that's what they wanted. So now, it's a little peculiar you yourself heard God speak. You yourself put Moses as the in-between. You wanted that. You got it. And then you say, but I don't believe you, Moses. I think you made it up. Uh, I think you're, you're mis misreporting. I think I can't trust you. That would be very peculiar to say since you trusted him to make, them make him the intermediary. 
right? There's no record that he was caught stealing or caught uh, sleeping on the job or something else where you could see any failures in, in Moses. So they had, according to the, this, this, the events that took place, they had every reason to trust that what they got, when Moses says he got it from God, it was true that he got it from God and gave it to them. That's, I think, that's, that's what the story says. So if we're, ta if we're taking it from the story, that I think is a very strong reason to, to, to take it. Yeah. Oftentimes, um, you could have two concepts that you know to be true with some gray area between them that you then have to judge within. For example, say justice, uh, this is a bad example, maybe justice and mercy, or maybe uh, whatever it is. So obviously you have the black and white cases, but then you have the gray cases, which are hopefully somewhere in between. So what is the term for the function that does that. Okay, so let me, let me make sure I understand. You say you have two concepts which, which you know to be true. Well, each one has a truth about it, but since they do conflict often enough, can't just say they're both true, because then you'll be saying that when they conflict, both sides of a contradiction are true, and you don't want to say that. <coughs> so you have two, two concepts which, each of which has a true use a true place of application, and sometimes they conflict, which creates uh, difficulty to, to, to adjudicate, difficulty to, uh, to um, decide how to use them at, in, in, that, in that circumstance. Now you, now you ask, how do you solve those contradictions? Is that what you're asking? I'm asking, what is the term, for example, you have Chacham of Dimna Das, is, is one of those terms refers to the uh, judgment that would adjudicate and decipher between these potentially okay so you don't you don't okay you don't mean a general term in the in the science of logic for dealing with any two concepts what you're talking about is when you have a two picking two concepts is what is the third concept that does that job because yeah. it can be different in every case yeah. so if you have Kokhmabina, das in a certain sense does that das in the middle but the same thing with Chesed and to ferris to ferris does it also that's a chod yisod. Yisod does it also. The third one is a mediator between, between the other two. But the question is how the mediation works. Mm -hmm. I, I struggled with this for years, actually. And I thought of all sorts of models, mathematical models and physics and chemistry and, and uh, biology, and, and I couldn't make it work. And finally, I asked my oldest son, you see, I quote him all the time, um, and he said, ah, but the reason it's not working is because you're taking a Jewish concept and you're trying to translate it into non-Jewish terms. So you have to expect that there'll be a misfit. So, okay, thanks very much. What's the right answer? He said, the right answer is what we call or and kli. You have a, a trio of, um, of um, uh, of concepts. One, in a certain sense, is positive. The second, in a certain sense, is negative. And the combination that mediates between them and uses them both in measure is where the positive one becomes the inner or the light, and the negative one becomes the kli, the vessel that bears the light, and it's a light-to-vessel combination. Now, that sounds unfamiliar, and that's good. It should sound unfamiliar because it's a Jewish idea. It's not from math, it's not from physics, it's not from chemistry, it's a Jewish idea. So if Tiferes is mediating between Ur and Chesed, that's right. then Tiferes would be the R. No, Chesed is the R. Chesed, Chesed is the positive, and Gvu is the negative, and Tiferes is the mediator. Why is one of them the positive? Is that, I'm saying Chesed is positive, or depending right. on the case? No, always... Always when you have these trios, which, which they, people picture as a segel, you know, two dots and a dot sure. in the middle of the, uh, below, always in these cases when you have this trio of dots, the right-hand dot is positive, then the left-hand dot is negative, okay. and then one in the middle is the combination. The question I was answering was, what kind of combination is it? And the nature of or is to influence and spread, as it is physically, that's what light does, and a kli, a vessel, let's t t imagine a, an opaque vessel, blocks light, contains light, holds light, prevents it from spreading. 
And now let's imagine a translucent, a translucent vessel. Now you have something new. The light is inside. The, the vessel blocks a great deal of the light from spreading, but some of the light penetrates the walls of the Kli and actually escapes. And that's the model for the way of combining the two, the two concepts so they work together. Now that's a very simplistic uh, explanation and has lots and lots of details and lots and lots of applications, but that's, that's what's going on. So, so yeah. the third, the, well, let's say Ferris is the, is the, the concept we, the third concept that we're using. Does it take up any space, so to speak, or is it always just, meaning if I have a spectrum of, of, one, to, of one to 100, and I have Hefs on one side and Zor on the other side, is there some middle 5% where Ferris takes up space? No, absolutely not. Uh, no, see, 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 this is a physical analogy or it's a mathematical analogy. It's the kind of analogy that I tried. My son said right. it's a wrong analogy because you're importing a non-Jewish concept to explain a Jewish yeah. idea. It is not a spectrum and it's a middle part of the spectrum. It's not like that at all. It's that they play asymmetrical roles in interacting with one another. One is internal and one is external. One is giving and one is restricting. And a combination of giving and restricting is something like a filter which allows some through but holds some back. That's not the middle of, of spectrum of, of colors at all. <clears throat> so where would where would Tiferet, how where would Tiferet be at that point? Well, maybe that's why we, we think of it as a, as a segel is right, left, and center below. Not in between, center below. It's separated from them. It's a third thing. So you have the light, you have the Kli, and Tiferet is, to use a physical analogy, the mathematician, so to speak, that engineered and calculated exactly how much, or how, how translucent this wall should be, and how... Powerful. No, you're putting too much concept, too much too much intelligence into it. The Kodesh Baruch Hu is the mathematician. He's the one who set it up. He created the, the, the Chesed, he created the Gvura, and he made the Tiferet as this kind of combination between Chesed and Gvura. So you, a person can he might be able to, be, but the, all right, this is the last time because other people want to ask questions, right? I mean, so uh, um, the three patriarchs represent these three ideas, and um, so Abraham is loving kindness, and uh, and uh, Isaac is strict justice, and ya Yaakov is the combination, which is called Tiferes, which is beauty and truth and all sorts of things. Now. If loving kindness by itself can't run the world on its own, and strict justice on its, by itself can't run the world on its own, and if combining them in the appropriate way into the, the combination of Tiferes has the appropriate type of interaction between the two of them to function on its own, so the question becomes, Maybe that's what, what should be running the world. Okay, maybe it's a historical process by arriving at it. That's true. But once you've got it, you've got it. Now, I happen to know that in the Jewish population, at all times, there's some people whose who's, uh, root above is on the side of loving kindness, and there are other people whose root above is in the, on the side of strict justice, and there are some people whose root above is in the combination. All three roots are represented all the time. So the question that occurred to me was, why do you have people coming from Avraham? Why are people coming from Yitzchak? When Yaakov is the combination, he's the perfection. Let everybody come from Yaakov. And the answer, I think, is this, that Kodesh wants the process of combining the two extremes into the center to be going on all the time. It's not that he did it, it's done, and we now we use the result. No, we have to be doing it all the time. So you have some people in the population who represent Avraham, some represent Yitzchak, some represent Yaakov, and the Avrahams play a role of, 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 of projecting pure loving kindness into the world, which is necessary. And uh, the ones come from Yitzchak project pure uh, justice into the world, which is necessary. And the Yaakovs in the world have to take those things and combine them. It's a continuous process. So it could be a person playing the Yaakov role. And he's doing that combining. That could be. But it's not, that's not to put down or put aside people who are playing the other roles. It's a continuous process. That's what I believe to be the, the, the correct uh, description here. Uh, uh, Zach, yeah? No? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, we said there are two different, like, 
for consciousnesses is expanded and constrictive. Um, yeah. When a person does certain drugs, uh, psychedelics per se, would you say that's more a constrictor or an expounder? Huh, I'd probably say it's both. You know, while you're doing the drugs, try to do math, or try to compute, try to do math. Right? That you're constricted. You can't do math. Sorry, your brain, your brain is on holiday. You can't focus on something like that. On the other hand, it gives you experiences that you wouldn't otherwise have. So I think those concepts are just too blunt to give you any any useful description of things. So if a person has certain, let's say, revelation during that time, would that revelation be something that can be a person to live the rest of their life from that? <sighs> For a revelation to be a real revelation rather than a hallucination or a dream or a fiction, it has to be connected to something objectively real. It can't just be psychologically um, compelling. Um, and then you would want to know, why would you think that it's objectively real? Why wouldn't you think that it's something that's just... Uh, you know, just a, 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 a figment of your imagination, a dream. Can, can you imagine a person having a dream where it would be appropriate for him to live the rest of his life on the basis of the experience of the dream? I think that would be very, very extravagant. I think it would, it would be a one, in a, a one in a billion chance. You know, dreams are just things that happen to you subjectively. They're, they're, they're not connected with anything, anything real. The prophets had real confirmation of their, of their experiences where the, you know, when God tells Abraham, Sodom's going to get it, and the next day he goes up and he sees, he sees a smoking ruin, that's pretty imperative. That's pretty objective. You know, everybody agrees, and you can go there, and you can sift through the cinders, the cinders and see that everything's burned, and so on and so on. There's not just an inner voice that's compelling. And a compelling inner voice can be something that, that uh, leads you desperately, desperately astray. And Chal says, where do dreams come from? Well, they came from what happened to you in the day, in particular what you ate, and what your hopes and fears are, and from transcendental sources that lie, that lie to you and tell you, tell you falsehoods coming from above, and also some that tell you the truth. And it's a chulun, and you can't tell what's what. You can't tell what's what. So what should you do with the dream? So either you have Chazal, or you have a, a tzaddik who can interpret it for you, and often, if you go to them and ask, they'll say, we don't know. We don't always just, just give you an answer. But in the meantime, when you have it, you can't take it and go with it. You have no idea where to go with it. So uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put uh, credit. And by the way, the objective tests that have been made of people under the, under the influence of drugs have revealed that their judgment is so impaired that when they did creative things while they were taking the drugs, they thought they were doing very great work and six months later, when they've been off the drugs for six months, they went back and looked at it and saw it was trash. So it, it, makes, it makes it impossible for you to judge things. You don't, your perception is, is, is not... Uh, you feel hyper-connected, but that's just the feeling, and it, can, and, it, and it turns out to be dead wrong. So I can't uh, give a vote of confidence for, for drugs. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what, uh, what would be a strategy to refute a claim that a religious person, or in general, any any person who has a set uh, goal, that before what he was doing, according to the populace, was not correct, or according to their interpretations, now what he's doing is, uh, like, it's not right according to them, and so who according to who? I'm t I'm saying like the majority of the secular world. Maybe would would say that religious people are not doing the status quo, and therefore they're not following the uh, the right way of the world that is to contribute to you know, okay. society. I was wondering what would the Rev say to kind of counter that, and how could we uh, live with it with a uh, with a positive outlook on like how we are actually contributing to the world and not. Okay, uh, I mean, this is another. These questions really require to be done completely, and you know, will require much more time than I can give it. And, 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 but the question is this: the outside world will look at us and 
we'll say we're living in a in a in a in a an imaginary world, and we're not doing anything constructive in this country. We have it all the time, you know. Uh, the the old communist idea was you're parasites. Uh, you're just living off the off the taxes of other people. And, okay, the whole story. How do we how do we refute that? Well, um, there are two things to do. One is local, and one is global. The local thing to do is to say, how good are you doing at Succeeding to build your own values. You believe in happy, constructive, shared lives in marriage? Do you believe in that? How good are your marriages? Do you believe in the appropriateness of living a lawful life? How good are you at producing a population that doesn't engage in crime? Do you believe that children should be realistic about their own limitations and also respectful of their parents? How good are you doing at producing that? The first thing you can, you can attack is how well are you really contributing according to the values you believe in? How well are you doing? Um, and I think, you know, where you have schools in this country where in order to get into school, the student has to go through a metal detector because you don't know what he's bringing into school. It could be a knife, it could be a gun, it could be a bomb. Um, and you point out that, well, Hashem, we have no metal detectors. <laughs> we don't use metal detectors. And you can walk on our streets at 3 a.m. and no one will bother you. Men, women. Well, my wife has a seminary. We were in, in Bnei Brak for, uh, for, uh, for Shabbos. She said, I'm going to give a prize to, this, to one of her students who counts the most unattended children in the streets. <laughs> Friday night, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, swarming with children. There could be no adults in sight. One girl counted 70 unattended children uh, over Shabbos. So are you really accomplishing so much more than, than we are? In the, in the, that's, that's one way to do it. But the global way to do it is to ask, where did you get your values from? What makes you think your values are the right values? Um, here's one experiment that I try on, on beginners when they come even into to our shirt. I said, you don't believe in the Torah. You don't believe in God. Okay, fine. But I want you to try an exercise of imagination. Imagine that you're standing together with three million people. You're standing around a mountain. And all of you here, under supernatural effects, you hear a voice. It tells you these are things you must do. One of them is Saturdays are special. Saturdays have to be, you have to be conducted a certain way. Would that have any effect on your plans for the weekend? <laughs> or would you say, yeah, I know I heard it, but I'm going to scuba diving. What can I do? You know, that's, my, that's what I'm scheduled to do. You know, maybe I'll think about it next month. I don't think so. If you were actually there and you actually heard it, I think you would take it very seriously. Okay, now, step two. Would you really have to be there? You know, uh, human beings don't live by every generation inventing the wheel. One generation invents the wheel, and one after that invents carts, and one after that invents submarines, and then, you know, we build on each other. Would you really have to be there? Wouldn't it be enough if you were convinced that it happened for you to learn from it? Well, then, whether or not it happened is really quite important. Because if it happened, then you would change a lot about your life, wouldn't you? But don't you think you owe yourself an investigation? Maybe it did happen. There are a lot of clever people who think it did happen. A lot of secularly educated people who think it happened. A lot of very bright people who think it happened. Don't you think you owe yourself at least an investigation to see? Because if it did, then a lot of the things you believe in at present, which define what is productivity and so forth and so on, will be strongly modified by in addition to reality, which you're not taking into account. That's one way to, to talk to people on a level that requires no acceptance, no pre 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 previous understanding, and uh, just to get them to think through the consequences of a reality that they haven't been dealing with. Yeah? Is it appropriate, is it appropriate to add on at the end of my davening that, Hashem, what I'm requesting, I don't want to use up any schar or olam haba for, I just want a freebie? <laughs> 
No, it isn't appropriate. I was asking whether I should ask at the end. I don't want to use up any merit. Um, my motto, although it's a little brash, is don't put God in a box. <laughs> don't tell God what to do. You know, I'll, t- I'll tell you, there are stories which I, to this day, I've asked people, I don't have a satisfactory, I just have my, my own judgment about them, where a tzaddik will do something, and he'll do something on condition that he shouldn't get reward in the world to come. And then he's very happy that he was able to do that mitzvah. Now we say, if you're doing it, and not to get a reward, then it's the highest possible mitzvah. And God's not going to reward that? Why not? How would God withhold the reward for that? And especially since we understand that a mitzvah changes who you are. It changes what you are. It makes you into a kind of receptacle for the light of Olam Haba. And the, the greater you create your ability to absorb the light, the more light you will get. And, that be, and, and it's built into the mitzvah to do that. And then you tell me, but I don't want this, to, I don't want this to, I'm very suspicious of stories like that. I don't see how, how it could possibly be that, um, that the person would, uh, would, not have, would, would not have that effect. But I, I, don't do God's business for him. We had a, a distant relative who got involved with the Karaites, and we asked our Rebbe Zatzal, uh, you know, should we pray for the person? What should we pray for? He said, pray that Hashem should help her. End of story. <laughs> Don't pray that she should read this book or she should go to that seminar or she should uh, move to Jerusalem. Or, no, no, no. Read it up to him. <laughs> Don't give him instructions. Just pray that he should help her. Therefore, I have to be very careful what I dive him for because then he's not going to use up merit. Well, what you dive him for is this. The, the I would say, the, the sure path for, for your diving being appropriate is to dive him for something that helps you serve at Kodesh Baruch Hu better. Now, of course, you might make a misjudgment about that, but at least you know that your motivation in asking is the right motivation. Right? If you make a misjudgment and you've thought it through the best you can, then of course, we'll forgive you because you've done the best that you can. But um, that's, the, that's the criterion. I want something that will enable me to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu better. That's really, that's really broad, isn't it? Yeah. Um, kind of going back to one of the first questions you mentioned, or a point you mentioned in one of the questions you were answering was, uh, how can... A- God, an all good God, do evil? Well, okay, so the, the, there's, the simple answer is that sometimes evil is a necessary means to a good. It's a necessary means to a good. And then an all good agent, make it simpler, an all good agent, an agent whose motivations are only to do good, will do evil on the grounds that by doing this evil, he can bring about more good. So it's not, it's not out of the repertoire of an all-good agent to do evil. The only question, I think, that applies to this explanation is that you say, well, if you're talking about a human agent, and he says, I can't get to the good without going through the evil as a means, I understand that. And then you're right. He's an all-good agent. He's doing the evil. This is just an expression of his goodness. But you're talking about God. God can do anything. So for God, we would ask, why can't God get to the good without going through the evil means? And the answer to that is that the concept of being all-powerful is tricky, and it's uh, subtle, um, and in some cases... There is no possibility of getting to the good without the means because the means and the good are related by straightforward definitions and straightforward logic. And we don't say of God that he does things that violate logic. So says Maimonides, so says the Malbim, so says other Jewish thinkers. We do not say that God can uh, create a square circle. Or Maimonides' example is the diagonal of a square, which is equal to one of the legs of the square, right? We, we don't talk about uh, God that way. So if you have a case where the means and ends, the bad means getting to the good end, are related by straight logic, then the question, why doesn't God get to the end without getting to using the means, which, means which, which, which translated would mean, why doesn't God make a square circle? That's not a question. That question is no longer a, a meaningful question. 
So um, that's the, the short answer. Of why. By the way, the two people whose phraseologies have become mottos in the Jewish people, Nochem Ish Gamzu, who said, Gamzu Latova, this too is for good. And Rabbi Kiva, who was a student, who said, Everything that God does, he does for the good. You have to pay very careful attention to both of those statements. One letter in Hebrew, the Lamed. Nochem said, this too is for good. He didn't say this too is good. He said this too is for good. If Kiva didn't say everything that God does is good, he said everything that God does is for good. Good. That means everything that he does is a means to good. It might be good itself, but it might not. It might only be a means. So if you think about these things, they, they, do, they say the opposite. They, they say that not everything is good. Because everything were good, then they would say everything's good. <laughs> they wouldn't say this too is for good. <laughs> for good is much weaker. It means it justifies itself on the basis of what it brings about later. If it's already good now, you wouldn't say that. You say it's good. Well, what's your question? <laughs> Last question. Metaphysically, what process occurs between me desiring to pick up this pen and my body executing that desire? So, uh, if you ask it, what what the process between desire and and picking it up. There are things in between which you should be taking into account, and that is willing it. Right? There are a lot of things you desire which you don't will. He said that. He really needs to sink. <laughs> and I can sink him. And I really like to sink him, but I'm not going to do it because I don't do things like that. Right? Okay. So desire is not the word. What you really want is will. Will is the decision to do. And then the body carries us. From our point of view, What's in between is that God causes the body to move. You don't cause the body to move. God causes the body to move. God, so to speak, takes your will into account, and he has a policy of almost always causing the body to do what you will it to do. Almost always, not always. And it's not, you're not causing him to do it. My word, I choose my words carefully. Those of you who know, I mean, I was trained in mathematical logic, so I, I choose my words carefully. He has a policy of causing the body to do what you will it to do almost always. So his power is in between your will on the one hand and the body's motion on the other hand. And how does secular nature explain this? Oh, they don't explain it. It's a big <laughs> mess. It's a big mess. Uh, they don't have any agreement on what the will is. They don't have agreement on whether such a thing is free will. They have, don't have ex agreement whether the experience is real. They are in a real problem. They're a real serious problem. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're interested in philosophical subjects, I have a wonderful suggestion to make. There's something called the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is free online, mm -hmm. run by the Stanford Encycl uh, Philosophy Department. And uh, the articles are written by world leaders in the, in the subject. And every article was like this. It gives an introduction to the basic ideas and concepts and questions that the field uh, deals with. And then it has the five leading theories. Sometimes it's ten. But okay, let's say five leading theories. Each theory, and then for each theory, what supports it and what contradicts it. And the last section is, program for further research. You know, what are we going to work on? What, what, kind, what kind of resources can we use? And the one thing you learn from every article is nothing's agreed upon. <laughs> nothing's agreed upon. Every significant question has five different approaches. That's very valuable. So I use it to say, when someone complains that what we believe in is ruled out by modern thought, modern understanding, you know, and so on and so on, that kind of tripe, yeah. I say, well, listen, this 20% of the best modern philosophers disagree with us. That doesn't make us right, but it means we're not ruled out. We're not ruled out. We're not obsolete. But to go through contemporary philosophy and arrive at a conclusion say philosophy verifies that this is the truth on the subject, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. There you go.
Okay.